Hello, everybody, and welcome to Secret Stash, the series in which we ask filmmakers, actors, and critics to share some of their favorite films that perhaps didn't get the recognition or audience they deserved because they were too strange, uh, too hard to find, or maybe too indie. Uh, joining me today uh, to share his secret stash with us is Michael D. Cohen, an actor who's made appearances on shows like The Mindy Project, Two Broke Girls, Modern Family, uh, and Chris Elliott's Eagle Heart. And along with his castmates, he was nominated for a Gemini for the animated series Grossology. Um, he'll be gracing the big, big screen coming up here soon alongside Miles Teller and J.K. Simmons for the drummer drama Whiplash. And uh, he'll be starring in the lead role in the upcoming dark indie It Was You, Charlie, which premieres at Tiff Lightbox in Toronto on August 15th. Uh, he was nominated for an actor for that film, uh, and, uh, you know, we hope he wins it, of course, because, because we're with, wishing him luck because he's our guest today. Uh, Michael, how are you, sir? I'm, I'm very good, but I have to tell you, the actor awards happened in February. I was nominated, but I didn't win, and so just, just, so, you, just so you know. <laughs> and I'm, but I'm proud to have been nominated, I have to say. <laughs> It's no cliche, but I, I, I really, it was a, it's an amazing experience. That's fantastic. And Michael, you know, it's funny, before we went on air, I, 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 I fact-checked all my stuff with you, and uh, I'm, such, I'm such an idiot because I still got it wrong, even though... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the Canadian-American thing, right? Because, like, you know, it's, the, the actor awards are Canadian, so I, you, you're off the hook. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, sir. And, and uh, you know, uh, I, I, to be honest, I'd never heard of the actors. Now I know about it. And uh, like you said, it's kind of the equivalent of the SAG Awards, correct? Yeah, it's the ACTRA is the Canadian Actors Union, like SAG AFTRA is for the U.S. So they have their own set of awards in the different cities and stuff like that. That's yeah. very cool. And congratulations on getting nominated. I think had we done this show before the awards, and I gave you my good luck. I think that would have pushed it forward, and they would have uh, come to their senses. And I would have won. No question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bernard Boo. I'm talking Bernard Boo. So. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. We, uh, you know, I'm. I'm just. I've just got the golden touch. Um, let's talk about. Let's talk about it. Was I'll be talking to you. I'll be talking to you, and every, like every month, I'll just be like. <laughs> Hey, I've got an audition. Can I talk to you? <laughs> no, you could just drag me around in a suitcase or something. I'm small enough to fit to fit in Perfect. luggage. Perfect. Let's we'll pack you under the seat. We're good. Yeah. So let's talk about It Was You, Charlie. Uh, this film looks excellent. I haven't caught it yet, but um, I'm so excited to see it. And it's and you're starring in it. It's coming out soon. Talk talk to me about it. Tell our uh, watchers and viewers uh, what they can look forward to. Uh, well. It's, it's a movie, uh, it was a Canadian film, uh, uh, written and directed by Emmanuel Sherinian, uh, who's an up-and-coming Canadian filmmaker, and he has a very unique sensibility. Um, it's a mixed genre film, so it is a dark comedy, but it's really much more dramatic. Um, they, they just cut a new trailer, and I'm so proud of this trailer. They did an amazing job, because it actually really does give you a good sense of what the movie's about. Um, and, and there's some, I get the opportunity to do some physical comedy in it, but it's, it's mostly, uh, it's mostly dramatic. And my character, um, is, his name is Abner, and he is down and out. Um, it takes place over 24 hours, and he's flashing back over different periods of his life, putting things together. And, um, he was in a, a, tra a car accident that, that killed a young woman. Um, and he, it wasn't his fault, but he still carries around the guilt. He has post-traumatic stress. He lost the woman that he loves to his younger, more, shall we say, classically good-looking uh, younger brother. Uh, he, he's uh, played by uh, Aaron Abrams, and, um, and, he, and he never forgave his brother for that. And so all of these things and it led to him eventually letting go of his uh, passion, which was being a sculptor. He was a, a professor of, of sculpting and, and a very good artist and he let go of all that and he just let his life slide and so it's really uh, it's it's a very interesting character study of watching how the mind can heal itself uh, through trauma and and what the mind does to get the answers that that human being needs in order to move on in life and uh, um, Emmanuel did what I think is extremely difficult to achieve which is to mix genres 
and, and to do so effectively and to keep the tone consistent throughout the whole film. And that's what blew me away when I watched the rough cut, uh, was like, wow, you achieved what is just the most, so difficult. Um, and, and if you look at a lot of films that don't work, it's I think a lot of it, I, I've done script consulting for many years and, and I read hundreds of scripts and every and most of the time the reason why they suck is because the the well, the writer is taking two different genres and just not mixing them. It's like you're you're reading two simultaneous screenplays. Mm. Um, and um, Emmanuel didn't do that. He managed to mix something and create. It's like that's what I think Tarantino did. That's why he was so successful is that he created his own genre by mixing something. Something it's like taking it's like a cook. You know, you take spices that you never would think would go together, and then you got umami. You know, it's just yeah, it's, yeah. Right? So that that's does that kind of tell you about the film a bit? Absolutely, I'm. I'm so looking forward to it. It looks kind of uh, right up my alley as far as what what I what I like about uh, dark comedies, and I look forward to also to it also because of your high praise as well. Um, we actually conducted an interview before today about that film. Uh, that it's all about that film, which you will be able to find on the site soon because the film's opening next week. So look for that article next week. Uh, an in-depth oh, interview right. with Michael. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you really? What, what are you, oh, right, that was with me. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah we did that. That happened. <laughs> um, but now, uh, uh, describe your pal, because you said this film is kind of uh, about our psyches and our, how our mind react, uh, reacts to things, and uh, your, your pal in films, you, you enjoy films like that, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, so much. I'm, I'm, I, 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 when I'm not acting, I, I work as an acting teacher. I have my own studio, and... and one of the things that I'm absolutely passionate about is actors really understanding how they work, you know, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Like, we really need to know how we work. Um, and I've just, I'm so fascinated with how human beings work. I mean, I will, no, I will never completely, ever understand it, you know, fully, but I love the uh, pursuit of it. And I love films that, that lend insight into how we work and and not in like I'm I mean I there's not that there's anything wrong with them but I just I'm not attracted to the real negative you know I'm not attracted you know there are some films that make a powerful statement by focusing on the negative of, of humanity mm. and I I have enough of that going on in my head and around me and on the news I don't need to watch a film about it all the time you know um, <laughs> So I like to watch films that reflect the positive back, the, the inspiration, the potential that we have to do good, because that to me, even if I never achieve it, at least I'm on the path to trying to. And, um, and so films, like, and, and so I think Emmanuel in this film really um, has a, a positive spin on it, you know, that, that even though, he, you know, my character goes through all this darkness, he comes out the other side. So and yeah, so I am very attracted to films that show some sort of intelligent and, and somewhat sophisticated insight into the emotional process of of a, of a human being going through their obstacles and and how they deal with that in a, in a, in a, an emotionally truthful way. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoy those films too, and I, I think uh, uh, you probably your picks will reflect these. I assume that my that the picture reflects that. The, no, uh, the picture and also your secret stash, your 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 suggestions. Oh, oh, oh! I was supposed to have. Oh, yes, my suggestions. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could blame it on the time zone, but we're on the same time zone right now. Um, yes, I, they were absolutely the the films that I picked will absolutely reflect that. Fantastic. So let's uh, hop right into them and okay. see what films you want to talk to us about and tell us why you love them so much. Okay. Well, I don't know how obscure these really are um, because they're not obscure to me. So I, I don't know if they're obscure to other people. But the 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 big one that I want to talk about was the film uh, that probably most people are familiar with, which is Fifty Four. Mm. Fifty Four. So that that came out in nineteen ninety eight, and it starred Mike Myers as Steve Rubell, the owner of, of Studio Fifty Four. Right. Okay. Right. Right. So this was. I mean, I guess you would call it a large indie film. <laughs> I mean, it had a pretty all-star cast. It's you know, it wasn't like something tucked away in the corner that nobody knows about particularly. But I, I picked it because I really believe it did not get the credit that it that was due mm. at all. Um, I definitely think Mike Myers should have been nominated for an Oscar for that. And oh, wow. 
his performance was, I mean, I remember, I mean, Mike Myers was at like the peak of his, peak of his career, or at least heading up to the peak of his career, very, very well known. And I did not recognize him until three quarters of the way through the movie. I'm like, wow. I know who that is. I know who that is. Who is that? Who is that? And then, oh my God, that's Mike Myers. He transformed himself so completely. And he hardly did anything. To, I mean, he didn't do anything to himself physically to transform. He didn't wear some sort of prosthetic or anything. He, he just, he combed his hair a little different, but that was it. It was, he was, he was so different in that, that the, that the muscles in his face were structured differently. Wow. You know, that, yeah, because he, when you take on a character and when you really, really understand a character and get into it, you look different because you're, you're operating within a different emotional structure. And so that affects how we carry our face. Um, so, I mean, if you've ever seen, I mean, I don't mean to be macabre, but if you've ever been around uh, a dead body, <laughs> you know, um, which I, I, I remember a relative that passed away and we were in the room, and then as soon as, you know, his spirit left, his face changed. Mm. You know, it was you just saw a different entity. You saw a different being, um, and it was his body void of his spirit. So, um, you know, the spirit or the whatever is going on, your personality informs how your face gets structured by tension and and relaxation in different areas. So his the way he carried himself, the way his face looked, his speech pattern, his physicality um, was so different than his default. Uh, physicality and and his acting was just incredible and he was playing um, Steve Rubell who was uh, openly and flamboyantly gay uh, which Mike Myers is so totally not right. um, and with no agenda no like you can tell when an actor has an agenda that's going on that their stuff is getting in the way of their performance mm -hmm. not clear completely pure performance I mean I was blown away, and I could not believe that he did not get recognized for the performance. And but I think that part of it was, I think especially at that time, in the late '90s, it was harder for uh, people who were, you know, comedic actors or, or comedians to cross over into drama. And I think a lot of people have tried that. Adam Sandler, Ben Stiller, um, Jim Carrey, maybe to a little bit more success. But people who are really well known for comedy. I think it was it was it was harder at that time for them to get noticed and get accepted for those roles. So I'm thinking maybe that was part of it. Oh, I see. That, yeah, that that sounds excellent. I actually missed that one. I think uh, I was probably when it came out. I was too young. I was <laughs> I was just a kid. But but uh, 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 thankfully, people can find Fifty Four on Netflix. It's streaming right now. So everyone out there who wants to see this incredible performance yeah. by Mike Myers. Uh, in a role that uh, is a kind of atypical of his career, check it out. You can you can sit on your couch right now, plop down, and watch Fifty Four. So uh, a good suggestion. <laughs> yeah, and the film was really panned by critics. Oh really? Oh great. It was, oh, great. It was totally panned by critics. And Ryan Felipe, who plays, who was this young kid at the time, plays the the other the lead role, uh, got a Razzie for it. <laughs> no kidding. That's yeah. amazing. That's no, not amazing. Now, whether or not that was deserved, I don't know, but but um, mainly it was like, you know, I, I don't think the film was as bad as everybody was saying, and I don't understand. I know that the writer-director really had to compromise a lot of stuff for the studio, or for the uh, studio, for Miramax, but um, I don't think they had a studio on, but they, they it was, it was uh, yeah, just one of those things that I think if it came out now, it would be more successful. I like picks like this because, uh, you know, if the film was critically panned and it got a Razzie, uh, that means you've got balls for just suggesting it, and I'm definitely going to watch it. I'm more inclined to watch uh, movies that did not get, get critical praise <laughs> because it's, it's, it's more interesting. I'm more interested to see if, if uh, I will, I will uh, also like it, so I look forward to that one. Yeah, yeah, I'd be interested to, to hear what you think. Absolutely, and uh, uh, let's move on then to your next pick, 54, you can find on Netflix now. Uh, but uh, what's your next pick here? Well, um, there's a Canadian film um, that was actually done the same year, in 1998, called Last Night. Are you familiar with that film at all? I'm not, never heard of it. Uh, written and directed by Don McKellar, who I was, who's, a, who's, a, who's a Cana is as close as you can come to a star in Canada, because we don't really have a star system, but... Um, he, he's a you know a, a legend in, in Canada, a, a, an amazing writer, director, and actor, and um, and I had the 
uh, privilege of actually working with him. He, he directed me in an episode of um, Michael Tuesdays and Thursdays, which was this wonderful uh, TV series that was short-lived, unfortunately, um, in Canada a couple of years ago that starred um, Bob Martin. Now, Bob Martin and Don McKellar, you may know from the Tonys, because they both, because, uh, well, the, the show The Drowsy Chaperone was, okay. was uh, their kind of project. I mean, it was, it, it, it started with a, a wedding present in, in real life to Bob Martin and his wife, and then it took on this life of its own, and Lisa Lambert wrote the lyrics, and anyway, I don't So Don and, and Bob teamed up and, and did this show, and um, Don directed a lot of the episodes, including mine. So I got to know him, but, but, I, but this film far preceded that uh, experience. Um, so last night, the premise is that it's the last night of existence on Earth. Huh. And uh, it traces uh, these in, interrelated people. And you don't know how they're quite related until it kind of comes together at the end. But they're all they're kind of interrelated and, and what they do on their last few hours on Earth. And what that's like, and and it's it's actually brilliantly laid out because it's not expository. He doesn't go into a lot of exposition saying, and now the world's going to end, and this is why it's going to end. You put it, you piece it together, and it it's an amazing lesson in storytelling in terms of what pieces of information are necessary and what isn't, mm. and how he focuses so much on what's going on for a human being when they've known for months that the world is going to end and it's their last few hours and how do different people respond to that and it's a story it's not just like a, some sort of mockumentary it's like it's an it's a narrative and and um, the ending I was going okay I wonder how this is how is this going to go how is this going to end how is this going to work what's going to happen and the way he did it was so poetic he just it was poetry so wow. I I just think it's one of those films that, I mean, I, it got a lot of accolades in Canada. Um, it won Best Canadian Feature at TIFF. Um, it, and, the, and in the States, I think probably the only place it was acknowledged was by the, the Clotrudis Awards. It won some awards there. Mm. Um, but other than that, I, don't, I think the, U, the U.S. just kind of went, yeah, next. You know, like, <laughs> what's this stunky Canadian film? You know, <laughs> But in Canada, it was celebrated. People were like, wow, this is amazing stuff. Um, Sandra Oh stars in it. You know, seven okay. years. This was seven years before she did Grey's Anatomy. Uh, Sarah Polly has a, a, a good role in it. David Cronenberg is in it. Um, and then Bob Martin has a small role. Um, uh, who else was in it? Um, Callum Keith Rennie. Jackie Burroughs, who's a, a Canadian. You know, these are all like uh, Canadian mainstays, you know? Yeah, Canadian. yeah. You know Canadian icons and uh, a lot of Toronto references. It takes place in Toronto. There's a streetcar, which is like this classic Canadian streetcar. They talk about Nathan Phillips Square, which is like the, you know, the place where you, in front of like you know it's a Canadian. It's in Toronto. You know, if you live in Toronto, you'd know what it is. If you didn't, right. you know what we're talking about. But it's like again, <laughs> it's like the specificity of what's important and what isn't in, st in storytelling. If I say, oh, we're going to meet at Nathan Phillips Square, do you really need to know what Nathan Phillips Square is? No, you just know that it's meaningful to those characters mm -hmm. and that it's a place that everybody knows. So, it, it, you know, they didn't have to say, it was Nathan Phillips Square, you know that square over by the, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's great for people who are aspiring filmmakers um, or just love film in general just to see how you can whittle a story down and that 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 human experience is enough, you know. That sounds so, fantastic. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Oh, it's great. <laughs> that sounds awesome. And uh, you, you know, you're batting a thousand because that one's available on Amazon streaming. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Free if you have Amazon Prime. Yeah, yeah. If you've got that Prime, which I, I you know, I'm still debating whether it's worth it. I, I still, I am a Prime member, but I'm not, not so sure of the value. What do you think about Amazon Prime? <laughs> Boy, I, I feel like I should call them up and get them to pay me for a commercial. Um, <laughs> I, I like it. I, I love getting my stuff in two days. <laughs> and I've watched a lot of movies for free on Prime. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I think it's great. I think because they don't get the uh, bigger titles that Netflix gets, but they get the titles that we like, right? Like the, these little gems like Last Night, which is not on Netflix. And, um, and Orphan Black. 
And Orphan Black. I know, right? Another Canadian Toronto, you know, uh, series that's shot there um, with Tatiana Mazzani, who's, oh, again, God. incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I said my wife started watching that show the other day. I couldn't believe, I, I looked her up. I couldn't believe she was Canadian. <laughs> couldn't believe it. And why is that? Oh, because she, she, her British accent was so convincing. Oh, got it. I was like, <laughs> our Canadian can't have that much talent. No. Uh, yeah, all the accents she does. I mean, it's just, it's wonderful. Wonderful work. Incredible. Yeah, it seems like a great show. And that, that seems like a great pick. Uh, last night, which is available on Amazon Prime streaming now. Uh, let's go into another one. You got more for us? I got, I got more. Um, now, these are kind of like my subset. Okay. Um, I mean, there is one that I have to say is my all-time favorite, but it is so not obscure, and it is <laughs> very, very recognized. Does that matter? No, no, oh. no, not at all, not at all. Well, it's in the theme of uh, what we talked about earlier, which is the depicting emotional truth through trauma, you know, in, in film that I tend to resonate with, uh, and that's the film Ordinary People. Mm. Uh, 1980, I think. I mean, it's an old film. Stars Timothy Hutton, Donald Sutherland, Mary Tyler Moore, Jed Hirsch. It won a bunch of Oscars. I mean, this film was recognized. Um, this film was a big deal. But I feel like it's the kind of film that, I mean, 19, if it was done in 1980, that's like, what, 24 years ago? No, 34 years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. This is like before you were born, I'm sure. <laughs> it is, uh, it is. <laughs> and did you have you have you heard of the film? Or you know, I've heard of the film, but this is good because even though you like you said it's gotten a, re a lot of recognition, uh, you know, films get forgotten, films get buried in time. So you're digging this yeah. up for us. This is a film that absolutely should not be forgotten. This is a film that is on my shelf. It will always be on my shelf. It'll be a film that I will watch over and over again. Um, I get kind of choked up when I think about it. Like it just. Oh, wow. It, it was so, when I first saw it, it affected me so profoundly. Um, I mean, it's really, quintess it's the quintessential dysfunctional family dealing with a major trauma. And that's the, the, Timothy Hutton's brother was killed in a sailing accident. And he survived, but his brother didn't. And his, his father, uh, played by Donald Sutherland, and his mother, played by Mary Tyler Moore, um, just show what happens to a family when something like that occurs and how they're already their personalities predispose them to those reactions. Um, if you're at all interest in, interested in that whole idea of healing and the mind and what we do to ourselves and what, what kind of support we need in order to get past these you know blocks and obstacles that we have because of trauma or whatever, this is the film. It is so brilliantly directed by Robert Redford. Um, who won an Oscar for direction, I believe, in that. Um, yeah, he did, he did. And it won Best Picture. It won Best Picture that year, and it won... Um, Timothy Hutton won for Best Picture. All Actor. right, nice. Others were, others too. I can't remember all of them, but they were, on, like, uh, nominations across the board. I mean, Golden Globes, the whole thing. Um, it, it really, I mean, 19, 1980, I mean, it was just... It was the perfect time for something like this because people already knew about therapy, they already knew about personal growth, but it wasn't really that kind of. This is before postcards from the edge, you know. Like it was, <laughs> it was way. It was just. It was such a window into uh, something it, that was so taboo for so many years, which was looking inside a family and what's going on. Mm. Um, so I just, I just think it's, it's absolutely must see viewing for anybody that loves movies. Um, and loves just connecting to, to, to humanity through that. Yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a great great pick because uh, for some weird reason I haven't seen that one and uh, actually never, you know, wasn't on my radar despite it, despite it being the biggest, one of the biggest movies in the world and winning Oscars and everything yeah. at one point. So uh, there's another one. You've given me three gifts here, <laughs> Michael, three gifts. Muscle uh, top. Yeah, muscle <laughs> top. Muscle so uh, you got any more for us? Um, yeah, I've got a few. Let me look at my list here. Oh, okay. Here's some of my favorites. Um, Top Secret. Do you know Top Secret? No, no. 
Okay. Now, these aren't necessarily like little indie films. I mean, at the time they were out, they were, you know, kind of, I'm not sure how well people knew Top Secret, but it was, uh, it was like in that genre of the Leslie Nielsen dry, like total spoof. It was a spoof on those like airplane and those spy comedies. Okay. Um, it's it's there's it's sort of dated now, but you can appreciate the datedness of it. Um, I, it was it's one of my all time favorite films. I love that film. So funny. It's such a great film. If you love satire, if you love if you if you love any kind of parody, it's amazing. Okay. Uh, and I mean, somewhat along, well, not really along those lines, but in terms of comedy, A Fish Called Wanda, love that film. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I uh, I just showed that recently to my comedy class that I, that I, the acting comedy class that I teach, and we took it apart after we sat around and talked about it and why it worked and why it worked so well, and you know the, the characters are so committed, they're so off the wall and committed. Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein, yeah, he's excellent. He's like you know. <laughs> just like, that's how he gets his mojo. He sniffs his armpit. You know? um, and Jamie Lee Curtis is brilliant in it, and just Great. you know, just completely seduced by any kind of foreign accent. In it. You know, she doesn't. It doesn't matter how idiotic or stupid the man is. If he speaks <laughs> foreign foreign language, she's just like melts. It's just hilarious. Um, and uh, I just. I just Awesome, awesome cast. Um, so that, so this is a top secret, uh, Fish Called Wanda. Um, oh, along the line, back, I'm jumping around a lot, but there's a, uh, I believe it's a Danish film called The Celebration. Okay. Um, along the lines of uh, Ordinary People, it, it kind of, it, it, it's the, um, a man confronts his family about the sexual abuse that he endured in that family. And he, wow. and, this celebration and it is powerful, really powerful film. And you know, I don't, I, I don't really go for the Scandinavian films too much because they are so often dark. I remember being completely like left in a puddle once when I was at the Vancouver International Film Festival, and I just wandered into this film. It was Swedish or something, and then at the end of the film, the whole family commits suicide, and I'm like. I'm never going to see a Scandinavian film again. <laughs> it's so dark and awful. Like It took me a week to pick myself off the floor after watching that. It was so depressing. And I was like, what is the purpose of this film? Like, Why did I need to see that? What, what is this telling me? Um, and so that, I think that probably shaped some of my preferences. Uh, but there are some amazing Scandinavian films, and they're another not all like that, and one of them is The Celebration. Um... And then there was another, you know, when I was at Cinequest for It Was You, Charlie was showing there, there was a Norwegian film that was playing there, and I feel so bad because I can't remember the name, and I did an interview. Him and I were being interviewed on the radio for this film. I will email you the name of this film because it was, it was great. And they did this, they shot this film, Norwegian film, on a DSLR camera. Nice. And the, the writer-director, it was his wife and kid that starred in it, and they would just like go, hey, we've got some time after lunch, let's shoot another scene. And he'd take huh. his little DSLR camera. You would never know that there wasn't a cinematographer, that there wasn't lighting, that there wasn't sound. Um, well, they did have sound, but it was this, there was like no sound. I, I mean, there was sound design, but it was like very. The, the, the whoever was in the field doing sound, it was just minimal. Mm. Uh, and they had the entire Norwegian film industry so angry at them because of what they managed to achieve on a DSLR camera. Basically, saying, "Okay, you're saying the crew is obsolete." So uh, they, but the, what they achieved was amazing. Um, if you look up uh, Cinequest and look up the Norwegian film that was there, okay, um, I can look it up before we I get off. And tell you the exact name. Sure. Um, okay. So let's get back to that. Um, Butterflies are free. Do you know that film? No, this is, this is, you're just uh, you're just killing it today. Old film, again, not an indie. It was popular, somewhat popular in its day. Stars Goldie Hawn. Um, it really was provocative, I guess, in its time. It's a woman that falls in love with a blind man, mm. and I think it's interesting to watch films like that to just see how how we've changed to kind of benchmark our sensibilities. And go, okay, would I have a problem if someone like had a relationship if I if I had like 
someone was dating a blind man. Like they, this, they were kind of basically saying like, why are you interested in him? And it, which is so bizarre today because we seem to have way more acceptance that people with disabilities are, you know, is all it is is that one particular modality that's hindered. Like, why are we basically saying that person has a, you know, should be diminished in value? And at that time, I think that they weren't quite up to speed with that. And so the film was basically a commentary on that, saying, yes, he's blind and. Right, so, okay, okay. Um, but it was a comedy. It was Goldie Hawn. It was a fa fabulous performance. Um, you know, she appears in her bra and underwear, and that was this big sensation. <laughs> I, it's funny. I just I looked it up just now, and the, the movie poster is, is incredible. It's magnificent. It is, isn't it? I love that. <laughs> Edward Albert sitting down. Everybody at home looked this up. It's Edward Albert sitting down and Goldie Hawn, and they're both scantily clad, and it looks like she's combing his hair. Yeah. <laughs> it looks fantastic. It's really a great film. It's a great film. Um, okay, let me see if there's any. Um, Unfaithful. Oh, we talked about that in our last conversation. Yeah, that moment with Diane Lane on the subway coming home after her tryst. I mean, I will never forget that from an acting perspective. That was where, I mean, what else is there? Yeah, you know, I get, it's like kind of unbelievable the colors of emotion she covers in seconds. Unbelievable, right? I mean, just so connected, so good. And she's like, you know, she's indie, you know, she's, that's pretty much all she's done. I mean, oh, she's done other stuff, but she's such a lover of independent films, and she just, you know, I think that one was, I think that one was Fox. I don't know if that was an indie, but, but still, I mean, she, whatever, she just, she's just phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah, she's great. And I had I was a kid when I was a kid. I had such a big crush on her. She's she, she, for some reason I don't think anybody else I don't think anybody else my age had a crush on, on Diane Lane. But I thought I thought just thought she was gorgeous. She is. I totally get it. I I, I knew that. I had a crush on Goldie Hawn. So oh, there you go. There you go. That, that, that's a started with butterflies are free probably. <laughs> probably, probably. Judging from I just look at that poster and you're like, how can you not, right? <laughs> so, okay, before we uh, let's wrap up here. Do, do you have any more uh, quick quick hits? Um I mean, there was a there's a film that um the director Emmanuel Schrenian had asked me to go s to see. Actually, I have it, it's called In Garden, which I ended up getting um just to prepare okay. Uh, to prepare for Charlie, and and the reason why is because I think this film also mixes genres and does so quite successfully. Um, it's uh, it was at Con and TIFF in '08, I guess, um, and it was it's Scandinavian. It's Norwegian. Um, it's fun. It's it's a fun film. I mean, he. There's certain aspects of this, admittedly, I don't get. But if you're a cinephile and you love weird, like obscure film, but not too off, the, like you know, it still has narrative. Like you still you can you can follow. Like there's a linear right. story. Why this is a good film to watch. Um, I really loved watching it, and I, I, it helped me understand what Emmanuel was trying to get across in terms of it was you, Charlie. And uh, what he was trying to achieve in the character study, because I mean, this man says very little um, in the film, but he is the film, and that's kind of how Abner is. I mean, there's not a ton. I mean, there's dialogue for sure, but there's not. It's not dialogue heavy uh, in in It Was You, Charlie, and and you follow. I'm in every scene. You know, you follow my character through. Similarly, as in Bill Horton. so it's it's a very different subject matter. It's different style, whatever. But there are some similarities, and it's a fun film to see. All right, and uh, I think that'll do it for us today. You gave us so many good uh, suggestions uh, that I can't pers I personally can't wait to dig into, especially last night. That sounds incredible. And um, thank you so much again, Michael, for for joining me. My my pleasure, and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what comments people have about these films. See if anybody agrees or disagrees with what I said. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Me too. I, I hope everybody checks these out. And uh, it was you, Charlie, opening August fifteenth at Tip Lightbox, uh, starring Michael D. Cohen, 
And uh, thank you again, and thank everyone out there for watching. Uh, we'll have also an in-depth interview about that film uh, coming up next week, so look out for that. Uh, thanks, everybody, and thank you, Michael. Thank you.